afternoon or good morning. It's not afternoon quite yet. Thanks for coming. I'm Allison Hart, and I'm the CEO of the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for joining us today for our October uh, Government Affairs Forum. We're going to have a conversation with Mayor Shane Bemis uh, about the balance of our city services and revenues and how those can be provided for to keep up the ex outstanding job that our city does um, for development and growth. Um, so I will uh, hand it over to Andre shortly, but I'd like to just do a few thanks to our sponsors for our Government Affairs Forum, the Gresham Barlow School District, Riverview Community Bank, PGE, and Metro East Community Media, who does a live, who uh, does um, video this presentation and rebroadcast it. I'd also like to acknowledge our elected officials who are here today, uh, City Councilor Lori Stegman and City Councilor Paul Warking. And um, our uh, board members for the chamber who are here, Matt Miller with Gresham Sanitary, and um, Lori Stegman, who's actually also a board member, as well as Kirk French and Ron Papstorf. So thank you for the leadership that they provide for the board. And then I'm going to turn it over to Andre, who is my esteemed colleague and so fun to work with, and also a board member of, of the chamber. So thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, first item of business on the agenda this afternoon, breaking news. Allison celebrated her 35th birthday yesterday, so please join me in wishing her happy birthday. I will start. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Allison. Happy birthday to you. And uh, secondly, we'll start the basket around. Please put your business card in, and the mayor will do the drawing at the end for lunch on us at our next uh, government affairs program. So there's a great story uh, involving the great uh, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. He was taking the train one day, and the train conductor went up to the uh, went up to the justice and asked him for his ticket. He, justice Holmes couldn't find his ticket, and so the conductor said, "Well." Um, Mr. Justice, uh, that's okay. You can just mail your ticket in. Justice Holmes turned to the conductor and said, "My good man, the question is, the question, the question isn't where is my ticket. The question is where am I going?" <laughs> and today, as a community, we will ask that very question: Where are we going? These are critical times for Gresham, Oregon's fourth largest city. Simply put, declining revenues are not able to sustain the city's needs and services. And Mayor Shane Bemis is here to speak to us about a proposal to address. The situation. Mayor Bemis is currently serving in his second term as Gresham's mayor. During his terms as city councilor and mayor, Shane has advocated for the city on issues ranging from economic revitalization, sustainability, public safety, and max safety. So here to address us and speak to us on addressing Gresham's needs and investing in Gresham, please welcome the mayor of Gresham, Oregon, Shane Bemis. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for taking the time uh, to be here today and listen to, um, I think this is the sixth or seventh time we've rolled through this out in uh, the community, and I should say that uh, we have had a lot of valuable feedback, and I'm, I'm certain that this uh, group will, will offer some valuable feedback as well. I did want to just note for the record, Andre, um, introduce the city councilors that are here. It should be also noted that there were others that were turned away at the door. Yes, we turned city councilors away at the door because we would have a quorum issue. Um, so they've been ejected and, and are, are, are out. So uh, I'm not sure if that's a good move for the city attorney, but hey, you throw your bosses out of the room. That's good. No, good job. Um, well, again, thank you. And um, I doubt that uh, anybody in this room has, pro has not heard about Gresham's unique uh, revenue position. But today I wanted to go into just uh, a, a little bit greater detail about where we are and about a tool that the council is looking at to address at least a portion uh, uh, of the issue. Uh, this, hap this afternoon I, I hope to briefly touch on revenue history in Oregon, how revenue reform measures have impacted uh, service delivery, and finally uh, discuss the tool we are currently considering to stabilize service delivery. How many people remember what was happening to their property tax bills in the 1980s? A few? Well, I can't say that I was super tuned into property taxation at the time, but uh, like many people, we definitely knew that something unsustainable 
was happening. As you can see here on, on uh, the, sh the screen, the blue line displays the growth in property taxes collected uh, per capita. On average, property taxes were going up around 13% a year. The red line shows the U.S. Consumer Price Index over the same period, uh, demonstrating that the economy was growing around 4.7% per year. It is clear that those uh, conditions were creating a large gap between people's ability to pay and the growth in the underlying uh, economy. Because of that circumstance, uh, two separate and very different property tax reform proposals were approved by the voters. The first reform uh, approved by voters was Measure 5. Measure 5 was authored by uh, Gresham resident and the late Don McIntyre. It was a relatively concise measure and basically said that cities, counties, uh, and special districts were limited to a total of $10 per thousand of a home's market value and schools were limited to $5 per thousand of market value. Notably, though limited in the amount per thousand of value that could be captured in the rate, the revenue source still grew with the home's value. Even with the past few years of home value declines, average growth is still around 5% a year. Now, Measure 5 does, does not currently have a big impact on Gresham because our proper our tax rate is artificially low, and we'll discuss that in the next <clears throat> slide. We, we do not have any homes that are at $10 per thousand of market value. In fact, if we were just under measure five, if we're just operating under measure five, we wouldn't even be having this discussion today. The next two reform measures came towards the middle of the 90s and were much more drastic for Gresham. Uh, measure 47 was the citizen initiative, and Measure 50 was the legislature's attempt to implement it. Functionally, they are the same thing. Measure 47 was written by uh, Bill Sizemore. The measure capped local citizens' ability to change their own permanent tax rate and set the rate at an artificial point in time. It capped growth at about three. Uh, it capped growth at three percent a year, and for the first time, disconnected property taxes from market value. Because math equations were now defining tax bills instead of home values, measures 47 and 50 created vast inequities between similar homes in different cities and even similar homes in the same neighborhoods. For example, it is entirely possible, maybe even likely, that an older home in your neighborhood pays a higher percentage of market value in property taxes than a brand new home recently constructed. Needless to say, this particular reform was tremendously hard on Gresham. Gresham had a 63 cent per thousand public safety levy that rolled off the books literally days before Measure 50 locked down permanent rates, meaning that had the levy stayed on the books for one more day, our permanent rate would have been 17% higher than it is today. At such a low amount, Gresham's uh, permanent rate is one of the lowest in Oregon. And again, Measure 50 stripped away citizens' local control to change the rate to better reflect their desire for public services. As you can see on this slide, prior to the passage of Measure 47 and 50, personal income, national consumption, and home values grew along similar curves. With taxes based on market values, services were funded through revenue growth that at least somewhat mirrored the economy. In 1997, when Measure 50 passed, you can see a new line spring off, which represents taxable assessed value. As you can see, that line starts growing at a slightly slower rate than the other economic indicators, slowly constraining resource availability for public services. While taxable assessed value on homes can grow up to 3% a year, we actually see growth coming in closer to 2% each year as a result of delinquency in tax payments and some property uh, devaluations. Each year, the delta between the bottom line and those other economic indicators means more constraint. While we are at a crisis point with that condition now, if you project it out a few decades, uh, the gap appears insurmountable. In addition to the constraint and growth, this slide shows Gresham's permanent tax rate stacked up against the other three largest cities in Oregon. Our rate is nearly half of Portland and, and Eugene's and significantly smaller than Salem's. Now you've probably heard me say before that I don't want to be one of those tall stacks do not want to build any trams and certainly no sustainability centers. 
But I also know that at the bottom uh, of that list, we're not providing the services that our citizens desire. Compounding the problems associated with our artificially low permanent rate, as a result of the economic realities we have experienced, our property tax receipts have flattened out and may actually come in uh, lower this year uh, than last. It is also important to note that when you pay your property taxes, as you know, only a small portion of that bill comes into the city of Gresham. As you can see here, we receive 25 uh, cents of every property tax dollar. Now, once property tax revenue comes into the city of Gresham, it goes into the general fund. The general fund goes almost entirely to fund police and fire, with small portions covering parks, economic development, code enforcement, and urban design and planning. This next slide shows general fund employees per thousand residents in Oregon's four largest city, cities. As you can see, Gresham has far fewer employees per thousand residents uh, and provides the same range of public services. In fact, in some instances, I would say we provide better services and obviously at a greater value. The average household general fund tax and fee burden in Gresham is around $60 a month. Households pay around $31 a month for 24-7 police response, $22 a month to have a fire truck uh, respond within a few minutes to put out a fire or administer life-saving CPR, $3 a month for parks, a uh, dollar for planning and economic development and code enforcement. Broken down into individual services uh, residents receive for the money, I would say that service delivery in Gresham feels like a value. But when stacked up against our fellow large cities in Oregon, that value becomes crystal clear. This slide shows the average monthly local government cost for that same range of service in Oregon's 10 largest cities. As you can see, Gresham is the most affordable. In fact, Gresham is a full $20 a month more affordable than the ninth cheapest city. Again, we are proud of being lean and efficient. But at some point, the constraint comes at such a cost, we are no longer providing the level of service that our citizens demand. Pictured here is a history of the Parks Department from 1997 to today. To today. We started with 19 employees in the Parks Department, which the truth be told, in my view, may have been too many. But in 2008, we were down to 15. And today, we're down to just a supervisor and a 78% staffed maintenance crew. The next cut in parks will be another guy on top of a mower, which eventually means that your neighborhood parks don't get maintained to any sort of livable level. But the Parks Department is just one example of what has been happening more or less citywide. As you can see on this slide, we have reduced our total workforce by about 70 positions since 2008, during a period when our population grew at about 6%. That circumstance has real impacts. As we have reduced the workforce and held the line on wages and benefits, we have also reached a critical point where further cuts begin to actually break the system. This slide shows Gresham's uh, six fire stations. If we are unable to stabilize our revenue picture, cuts to our fire department could result in the closure of fire stations, which would decrease response time and make us less effective when you need us the most. Our firefighters and emergency responders do such a good job uh, in Gresham that we have one of the highest level of cardiac arrest survival rates in the entire nation. As a result of our tax system, we have also operated with an incredibly lean police department. The red line on, on the top of this graph shows the industry standard ratio for police officers per thousand, suggested by the National Police Chiefs Association. They recommend one and a half officers per thousand residents. The blue line shows uh, Gresham's 15-year average ratio at 1.2 officers per thousand residents, significantly lower than uh, the industry standard and lower than our neighbor to the west, which seems to have a heavy interest in moving crime to the east. The green line at the end of the graph uh, displays what our police staffing ratio would be with, temp with temporary grant-funded positions removed from that number. I do want to note that while uh, temporary funding is not ideal, we have worked extremely hard to secure these sources of revenue, be it chasing down ARA funding, COPS grants, or repeatedly lobbying the legislature to fund the East Metro Gang Enforcement Team. We have done exceptionally well in securing grants. Now, I don't want to dwell on what the world would look like without the grant-funded positions because uh, I remain convinced that we're going to make the investments necessary to prevent it, 
but I think it probably goes without saying that a city with 0.99 officers per thousand residents likely would not be safe for the officers nor the residents. As I said earlier, I believe that the best solution to this problem would be to fix our broken uh, tax structure on the state level. We have worked hard to do just that. This slide shows a two-page letter I sent to Governor Kitzopper, along with 22 other mayors in the Portland region, imploring him to take the issue seriously and to move it up on the political agenda. I am still hopeful that eventually something will happen, but the response we, we got from him essentially said that he's supportive of tax reform but is pursuing other priorities at the moment. Now, we've heard recently in the news that the governor has been holding some meetings with labor unions and business groups regarding revenue. We have no idea if these discussions include uh, issues with local government revenue or if they include spending reform. But it looks like his timeline is going to be too far out uh, on the horizon to help with our immediate need. As you can see here, the financial chasm the city faces next year is substantial. The structural issues caused by Measure 50, flat or declining property tax revenue, other general fund revenue sources not performing as expected, and economic inflation create a gap of five to six million dollars. Obviously, our instinct is to first look at efficiencies and reductions in essential services and less essential services to meet uh, that need. Uh, we do that regularly and will remain vigilant in continuing to search for strategic reductions and efficiencies. But <clears throat> at the end of the day, where does that put us? And I think it puts our community at a defining moment. Either we'll define the solutions that will stabilize this ship or our threats of crime and adverse livability will define us, and that is simply not an option. Too much is at stake for us to defer any longer. We absolutely must protect police positions to combat gangs, drugs, and property crimes. We must protect our investments here, be they financial investments in homes, businesses, moral investments of time and talent and passion. We cannot accept the scenario of a fire station closing, leading to delayed response times when we need our emergency responders the most. So what's the plan? Well, seeing no progress on statewide solutions, we are putting a proposal on the table that would reclaim the local control and power over the situation and start to stabilize uh, services that are vital to our families and our communities. Specifically, we are considering a police, fire, and parks fee of $7.50 per month collected on your utility bill. The fee would be assessed on homes, multifamily dwelling units, and businesses. We all share in the benefits of this great community, and we all should have a role in ensuring in its success. All of the revenue collected from this fee would go into a dedicated revenue fund and be spent only on its intended purposes. The vast majority, 95% of the revenue, would be used for public safety services with the remaining 5% uh, revenue supporting parks maintenance. If we enacted the fee, where would we stack up relative to the 10 largest cities that we looked at earlier? Well, we would still stack up quite favorably, remaining the most affordable for the average household by a nice margin. Let me just conclude by, say, by saying this. And, um, it's not going to be any secret to you, to anybody in this room, but I love Gresham deeply, and I feel an overwhelming uh, sense of responsibility to speak the truth about where we are and to propose something that could help us move forward. I don't love this specific tool, and I'd greatly prefer statewide uh, reform, but I am unwilling to let Gresham sit back and fall victim to circumstance when there is something we can do on our own to take responsibility and to set our own path, I think a better path. Now, as you know, we've mailed letters to every household in Gresham in addition to a broader uh, newsletter explaining our situation. Conversations like this are also helping us to hear from our residents and balance the needs uh, for vital public services with the burdens that this will place on households. Collectively, we share uh, these issues and challenges, and the only possible solution to our issues will also have to be collective. The more participation, the better, and, and uh, anxious to have those conversations and have had a lot of them already. Again, I want to thank you all for being here today. We have um, the city council is here as well as members from uh, the city uh, manager, city attorney, uh, and senior staff at the city to answer any questions uh, 
that you that you may have. I should say, since this is the the last of of these that we have had, a couple things that have have come up regularly in the town halls um, uh, have been: what about a cap? What ensures that uh, you will not raise this fee the next day, the next week, and, and continue to go up? Um, I think, from what I've heard of everything from the city council, and I should say again, no decision has been made. We will discuss all of this information uh, actually at today's city council meeting and we'll continue to discuss it. There, there is no decision point scheduled yet. We're still in the information sort of gathering um, a stage. But one of the things again that has come up um, is, is a cap. With that, we'll open it up uh, for questions. And again, thank you for the time. Mr. Mayor, I guess I'll, I'll start with the, the first question is um, the amount of 750. How did, how has that number arrived at? Why not eight? Why not seven? Why not 650? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the administration at city, the city manager and the, the financial office looked at what the, what the gap was going to be next year. Uh, that number is greater than $7.50. However, in trying to balance the need with people's ability uh, and recognizing that this $7.50 will be, can hit some people incredibly hard. It can hit seniors hard. It can hit low income hard. Um, we didn't want, you know, to go for $12 or $13 or whatever that may be. So that, that's how the seven fifty dollars came. Mayor, I, I apologize. I, this is the first one I've been to this presentation. You've been a little busy. <laughs> um, if the state does come up with a solution for the revenue, if they do say, uh, you know, repeal measure 50, is there a sunset provision in this or is this bounded by time or is it just an open-ended fee that would be assessed? It's a good question. The sunset issue has, has come up. And, and in, in reality, as you can see by the trend lines, um, unless there is statewide reform, you will always have a need for this fee. Um, but if statewide reform comes, the repeal of measure 50, which um, Don McIntyre and I sat in this room the last three months arguing about working together to repeal Measure 50. Um, unless that happens, I think this is a, a tool for local government to sustain services. Hello, I'm Marguerite. <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Marguerite Troopman. I'm a real estate broker in the area and also a resident of Gresham. So why isn't this going to a vote to the people? I don't personally have a problem with the 750 um, fee. Um, I have a problem with the process of it being put on the utility bills mm -hmm. versus going to the vote of the people. Mm -hmm. It's a good question, and it's one that hasn't been determined yet. It's one that's come up in all of the town halls. Um, there are folks that uh, vehemently believe that this should be voted on by the people. There are other folks that say, get it done, and, and solve the problem. Um, we've heard from both sides, and, I, and, I, and quite honestly, I can't tell you where the council is going to land on that. It's gonna be continuing part of the discussion, but it is a comment that has, that has come up regularly. It seems that other municipalities are suffering the same issues uh, that Gresham faces. Uh, have you determined, have done a study, either formally or informally, of what other cities might be doing? Oddly enough, um, or unfortunately enough, Gresham is sort of the first kind of city off the conveyor belt. And the reason we are is because you can see the, permanently, the permanent tax rate is so low. Other cities have higher rates, so they're able, they have been able to sustain those. But as you run those numbers out further in time, those cities will be facing, without reform, those cities will be facing the same delta that we are facing. There are um, some cities that have, um, have used this, has, have used this uh, tool. Um, there are some cities that have used this tool poorly, uh, actually, and, and have raised it and raised it and raised it and raised it. That's why I think a cap on this, if, if the council were to go forward with this, that a cap is a prudent way to, to approach it. I'm Lila Leathers, Leathers Oil, and you say that it would be a cap, so in other words, that would go in at the same time this fee went in. Okay, what uh, part of the five to six million dollars a year do you feel that this 750 will cover? About three and a half million. Okay, 
Yep. One of the things that, is, uh, that has come up in the town halls as well, and, and I'd be interested in hearing from uh, folks in, in the business community about this, but the 750 rate. Uh, a lot of folks have said, now, why wouldn't Boeing pay more, or why wouldn't Fred Meyer that employs a lot of people more, or you know, these larger corporations, why can't we ask them to pay more? Um, and we, you know, we, when we developed this plan, it was just a flat across the board. Everybody pays the same, including every... Um, apartment unit. Um, what do you think of that? Hi, Mayor. Um, I've talked to some business owners uh, uh, that have a, a high usage of water, and I think it's the most equitable and fairest way to do that. People have asked me about the, the multifamily then, too, and I, I truly believe that that is the most fair and equitable way to do that. Mm -hmm. I kind of feel like we're at a wake. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What, what? You know, what? sorry. <laughs> Have you concluded the, the town halls? Yes. yes. And can you give a synopsis of the kind of feedback? I mean, you, you've referred to some of the comments, but uh, some of the, the synopsis of pro and, and against that you've heard in the, feed, in the town halls. Well, you can see that um, Councilor Working was actually my front man for most of the <laughs> town halls. <laughs> um, I, I will tell you this, I, um, uh, I have 10 years in elected office uh, representing the city of Gresham. Um, the hardest thing I ever did prior to the first town hall was to go to the fire union and tell them that I wouldn't support them on a fire district after they had contributed my campaign and pounded signs and, you know, sitting across the table from these big fire guys and uh, telling them I couldn't support them. I thought that was the hardest thing I'd ever done in politics. This was probably the hardest thing I, I ever did. I walked into the first town hall meeting. You're not, you're not bearing any good news. Um, and you, you realize that there is anti anything on one side and there's pay more on, you know, it's, you just don't know where, where folks are. Um, but I will tell you, it absolutely restored my hope and civility. We had uh, packed houses on, at almost every single one of them. A couple of them got pretty heated, you know. Um, but they ended, they ended good. Uh, the concerns um, that have been raised, the cap, equ equity, you know, I I is it uh, uh, equitable uh, for all concerned? Apartment owners do not like this because every apartment unit pays, um, which, is, which is sort of different if you look at, if you look at multifamily housing in terms of residential property taxes that are paid, multifamily housing pays 13% of the residential uh, property tax receipts, they pay 13% and they use 52% and 53% respectively for police and fire services. So this actually adds equity to multifamily that they're not currently, um, cur currently in. So multifamily, most of them do not like this because they have to, they have to write the check and then collect, pass it, uh, the rent on. Um, one of the things we have tried with multifamily to do, sitting down with our advocacy group, recognizing that uh, a hundred unit complex is gonna be a large check to write on day one for all of those units, some sort of a phased in approach over the next year to say, okay, this is coming in, this, this is coming in three months, this is coming in six, and this is coming in nine total in a year, um, to give them the opportunity as they're writing new leases, you know, to include that in uh, to, to the new leases. So that's been, a, a, an issue that has come up. Um, I think that people um, people understand where we're at financially in terms of the general fund and in terms of of uh, police and fire. Um, so they've been they've been really 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 good town halls. I've enjoyed them mostly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is going to replace about three and a half million of, of the shortfall. So um, what are the things that are going to be left out in the other three million that we're lacking now? Yeah, I'm going to kick that one to uh, City Manager Kavarston. As he, he, gets the, he gets the opportunity to uh, propose the budget and we get to dispose it, as he says. <laughs> 
Thank you, Mayor, and thank you very much for the question. Um, as the Mayor noted, we, we tried um, to find a spot with this proposal that will allow us to address um, the revenue needs for next fiscal year, at the same time being as sensitive as we can to, um, again, the where a lot of people are at in the community, which, as you all know, is still recovering. I think there are certainly good signs ahead. Um, we will, as we work through the budget process, um, as we do every year, um, assess all the other additional revenues and, um, again, come up with a proposed budget um, that balances the budget. I am confident with the 750 fee we will be able to maintain uh, current services. That is, um, again, no more reductions to police, fire, or parks. But, again, that will be part of the, uh, the specifics of that comes through the budget process, which um, we begin shortly after the first of the year. And for those of you that don't know, some of some in this room actually serve on that committee, but the budget process is seven members of the community and the seven members of the city council that come together to go through all of the budget hearings. Uh, Sue O'Halloran, um, I'm on the city's finance committee, so we'll be um, giving some recommendations and thought to the council as well, and so have sat in on some of the town halls. But I wanted to go back to the question that you had asked about businesses. And so one of the things that had been in my mind is, to, and, and I recognize it's hard for us to know exactly how many employees a business has, but it seems sort of like a reasonable assumption to say that for every 100 employees that you have, that there is some degree of services that do come from police and fire. So it's in my mind to think about perhaps for businesses that for every 100 of employees, the fee of 750 would, or whatever you agree upon, but that fee would apply to every every 100 members. And so it'd be interesting to hear if there's anybody who's a large employer here, but I was thinking that that had some reasonable uh, assumptions about the kinds of services that they might receive. Yeah. It's a it's a fair point, and one of one of the um, one of the problems with um, with this on a utility bill is it has to be the same universally. Uh, if you start to change it or rate it, then it goes against all of the the uh, property tax uh, reforms. One thing you can do is hold businesses out uh, and p put that sort of um, implementation something or something similar to that on a business license versus the 750 direct on the utility bill. So there's a way to do it, y yeah, yeah. Along those lines, Mayor, what services do the businesses, I mean, how much service did the businesses use in our community as opposed to the residents of the community? I think it depends on what business you ask. Uh, you know, um, Monday night or Sunday night, uh, four of the businesses in downtown Gresham were broken into and vandalized. So um, obviously used police services and um, uh, whatnot. Uh, there's large employers um, that we have cooperative relationships with through Hazmat. Um, you know, uh, on a whole, on whole, I would say, um, and this is just, obviously just a guess, but I would say on a whole, most businesses use less services than they pay for. And actually, truth be told, probably most houses use direct less services than, uh, than they pay for, except for what is the social contract, right? I mean, holding everything together. Good questions. Huh? We actually have our own town hall going right now. We have the mayor of Gresham. <laughs> All right. How about anything other than revenue? Yeah, yeah. Any yeah, other yeah. questions? <laughs> how about those dogs? Can you give us a, the the latest on uh, your uh, your discussions with TriMet and Max Safety? <laughs> um, you know, actually, um, when all of when all of the Mac safety issues went down, we had um, different representation at the TriMet level in terms of who represented East County. We also had a a different um, um, 
CEO at TriMet. Some of those things have changed. Um, so I, I have felt very confident um, in the last two, the, 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 the current one being Travis Stovall, have felt very confident that they are protecting our interests um, for East County and to, to try and keep us uh, safe and to keep fair inspection going. But <clears throat> one thing I learned in, in speaking out against TriMet is it's very, you can follow it over the years, it's very episodic in terms of you can put a lot of heat on them and they kind of come down and then it starts to go up again and you put a lot of heat on them and then it comes down. So we've got to continue to keep heat on them and I feel good about where our board position folks have been in the last couple of years. And if you're a politician running for office, you put max safety in everything that you send out. <laughs> you would be for that, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, I have a question since we're off topic. One, one of the numbers that uh, was interesting to me in the percentages is the planning uh, is equal to the parks. There's 3% of the tax revenue. You flip um, that back who would, pardon me? I'm sorry, I was asking Eric to flip it back to the slide. Uh, right. And uh, just wondering um, uh, what the purpose of the three percent. That seems to be a high number in the in the planning for me. Could I don't you could you uh, add to that as why that number is so high? Yeah, uh, I'm going to let I'm going to let the city manager yeah. take that one. Or thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, in comparison to other cities, that number is actually very low. Um, uh, Gresham has got a very lean, uh, effective planning department. Um, we do, again, within the constraints of the state laws um, and the city codes, which govern processes, I think do the best we can, always looking to improve in that arena. Um, but again, I think if you look around and see some of the successes in Gresham, and also if you look around and see some of the failures, I think planning is at the core. Um, uh, so I think it's always in a community's best interest to invest in planning. And also, I'll tell you, it's in the community's best interest to stay actively involved in planning processes and again as chamber members again I look around the room I see many of you have been very active in the planning process um, again we need to do a better job of uh, making sure there's easy ways for you to participate in those processes but again I'd always encourage you to continue to participate in planning processes because absolutely key and important uh, so again that that um, comparison to other communities that's actually lower than many um, as is, is the parks number again the 95% uh, to public safety um, again uh, kind of trumps all others in terms of where Gresham invests their their general fund dollars I'd like to point out that it's three dollars out of the sixty dollar uh, total, so it's actually less than 3%, or pardon me. So what so percent is that, Chief? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little bit more than 3%, but uh, as a whole, it's not very much money. I told Eric, and he agrees. <laughs> <laughs> he nodded. <laughs> Thanks, Andre. <clears throat> I think one of the concerns that uh, we on the Finance Committee have had is the elimination of the rainy day fund. We don't have anything to fall back on. And uh, particularly as far as the emergency management area, if we had a major catastrophe right now, we'd really be in tough shapes because we, we don't have any funds to draw back on. We'd rely to a certain extent on federal funds, but the immediate route requirements would have to be met. Um, the other thing is that when you look at a business and you compare the, the steps that a business takes to cut back, so is the city already done. If you put them alongside, the only difference being that the city can't turn around a cut fire department, cut essential services. In a business you can. But um, I'm impressed by the way that the steps that the staff within the city have taken to economize as well, which is, of course, what you would do in a business. Uh, you'd take those steps too. But um, in seeing um, the staff, for instance, up at the operations center, they had a leaky roof. It was going to cost, they put out for bids for $40,000. They said, we'll do it. So you had the staff fix that roof for nothing, part of their. You had. Uh, looking at the cost of uh, gas for uh, our vehicles, 
uh, consolidation of going down to Reynolds uh, High School uh, area down there versus using uh, local stations save $50,000 a year. So staff is very conscious of being a part of this uh, cutting and um, saving. So I'm pretty proud of the way they do that. So. Uh, Mayor, a few years ago, uh, when we looked at the budget, when I was on the finance committee, uh, you looked at the fee structure and the t property tax, and they were pretty much equal in terms of the amount of revenue that was generated. So uh, with the stabilization of the tax, or the property tax, then you see this trend for not just Gresham, but from the other municipalities of trying to look at the fee structure to uh, take up the slack because we've almost frozen the property tax, not uh, primarily through growth or yeah. through the lack of value or or those other kind of mitigating circumstances. Right. <laughs> it's not uncommon. We're seeing this happening with uh, education now. We're spending, putting more and more responsibility on students for their payments or, and yeah. more and more fees yeah. to do the support. So yeah. you see that trend in most of uh, not only Gresham, but other municipalities. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And we've, and we've resisted it in Gresham, as you remember, um, in terms of transportation, uh, utility fee. Um, we said no. And, and I have... Um, Again, I said this isn't my favorite tool because I've spent um, almost every day that I've been mayor saying we're not going to do fees. I, I think that the system has to be fixed on a statewide level instead of this hodgepodge of fees here, fees there. Let's go after development uh, uh, permits, you know, to fund the 100 percent fund the development planning. Let's uh, let's pass a transportation utility fee to uh, fund um uh, transportation programs let's now we're gonna pass a fee to do public safety I think this is a bad way to provide local services but other cities are doing it we've resisted it and resisted it and resisted it I thought for certain that a democratically controlled legislature with a democratic governor would have taken on this problem somewhere along the line and tried to fix it instead they leave it to the Republican mayor to to talk about it <laughs> Um, but nobody, nobody wants to talk about, nobody wants to talk about reform. Nobody. I mean, including the governor that said in his campaign, I do want to talk about it because local governments are starving. Again, we're just further down the road than, than most local governments. But, you know, Portland, Portland doesn't help us with their wild, crazy spending. They, you know, I mean, it, it puts all government in a, in a, in a view you know, that doesn't help any of us. And that's why, you know, we've tried very hard to be very upfront about about what we're doing in the community, where we're doing it, how we're spending the resources, um, because I think every single one of us take that job pretty seriously. Mayor Bemis, I know that uh, I've read in the papers that the uh, PERS is coming along at an increased level. Is this, does this in any way have a uh, part of why we are so far behind? We have actually, I'm gonna, another kick to the city manager. <laughs> Thanks for coming, Eric. Uh, 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 actually, we have, um, and as city manager will tell you, we have fared quite better uh, on PERS uh, than, than most, and, and in fact, most of our, or 40% of our employees right now are in kind of the, the, the after reform of PERS, or the last reform, are, are in that category, which is basically a 401k uh, versus that first tier uh, PERS. So as those retirements are coming off, we're doing better. But Eric? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the Mayor made a very good point in terms of 40% of the employees being in that, that next category, the officer piece. But um, it's also important to note that we are an independent entity within PERS. We're not part of the statewide pool. So our PERS rates, uh, based on employees we currently have, as well as uh, the employees that previously worked for the city. So um, fortunately, we have not employed any football coaches or surgeons at OHSU. <laughs> so um, a lot of those things you read that really drive the PERS rate are, are, do not affect Gresham. Um, the next two years, uh, we expect our PERS rate to increase, the city's PERS rate to increase about 2.5 to 3 percent. Um, and our PERS rate is about 60% um, of what the state's rate is. So again, it's um, oftentimes these town hall settings, we've had uh, people kind of lump PERS together um, as one, uh, understandably so. That's kind of how the media covers it sometimes as well. But again, a couple of things that really distinguish uh, Gresham and our PERS uh, liability compared to other entities. And again, we are in, again, in a far better position um, than um, many other entities. 
Eric, if you would, just for a second, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second. But in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the city's uh, borrowing and debt load, I think oftentimes we see these cities that are going bankrupt or on the verge of bankruptcy and all of that. What I want to say today is we, we, we obviously have a problem in the general fund to, to, to fund basic services, but we are also very fiscally conservative in terms of our debt load, in terms of our reserves. Eric, do you want to touch on that just for a second? Be my pleasure. Normally, this is where I turned over somebody else, but, uh, <laughs> but he's not here, so I'll just have to go do the best I can. Uh, the, as the mayor pointed out, you, again, you read about the cities in California that really are going broke because they can't pay their debts, and uh, the city has an extremely low debt ratio. And I, I do want to take a minute. Um, I've been city manager here um, nine years, was in Troutdale eight and a half, so kind of been around this area for some time. Been around local government uh, nearing 30 years, and I, I really um, want you to know um, your elected officials, mayor, councilors I work for, and the finance committee members. I see Sewell Howard in here, Dave Shields, extraordinarily, uh, Kirk French, Kirk, I apologize, uh, extraordinarily responsible in their uh, actions towards the budget. This city has never taken the easy way out. I've um, been really impressed with their stewardship. Um, they've always maintained um, a, uh, had to fight hard to maintain at least a very minimal uh, fund balance, um, again, to secure for the next, the next year. So again, I think the business acuum uh, of, of the community really shows itself. So again, um, you should be proud of the role that the mayor and council play and also, again, the budget committee members. Um, and again, as those openings come up, I'd encourage any of you to, to participate. Uh, Kirk's been a wonderful addition um, here to the, this last couple of years to the process. That's because he knows how to calculate food cost. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, since we were a little bit off task earlier, I'll go back to off task. Um, <laughs> when you were talking about TriMet and the crime that was going along with TriMet, what is your feel and what will Gresham's position be where Metro had been talking about wanting to put a, another light rail um, from Portland to Gresham down Powell, and now they've switched, and that was at $146 million per mile, but now they've switched over to talking about a rapid bus system. And um, was kind of wondering, um, I think in a, within another, or within the year, they were going to start a million dollar study on that. So I um, was wondering what your position and also if Gresham has any general position on that. I can tell you my position on another max line down Powell from Portland to Gresham, not only no, but hell no. Uh, I, I don't have any desire to put another light rail um, to service East County. Uh, I don't think it does us any, I don't think it gets us, I think the net effect of that is a loser for us. Right. Um, uh, public transportation can be a very good thing and it can serve and I think, I think, um, I think we have to be careful in terms of an urban city growing and, and as we grow in density and grow in population, we're going to, we're, we are going to have to have some element of public transportation in that, but I'm not convinced that this isn't, that this line that we have now doesn't suffice with the combination of, of bus or, or, or rapid transit. Right. Well, I actually got to thinking about it a little bit, really analyzing was I really, I wasn't so much opposed necessarily. I mean, I am opposed to another light rail. I'm not so much opposed to actual, like you said, having the transportation, but I think what I'm opposed to is the density that goes along with that. As soon as they'll put something down that, you know, whether it's a rapid bus, then all of a sudden you change the zoning to high density and that's what you know, you put too many chickens in a pen and they're going to be pecking at each other. And that's what people will do too. And uh, so I think it's more the density issue that I have a problem with. Yeah. Sorry to hog the mic today. But You're fine. <laughs> I've not heard any uh, officials talk about, I read in the paper they're planning, Metro is planning to put a zoo, elephant zoo out at the old PGE park, um, the lake out there in Sandy. Roslyn, yeah, Roslyn, Roslyn, oh, Roslyn Lake. Lake. Uh huh. And um, I was just wondering if you know anything about that and what's the chances. I don't know. I can't see that we need a herd of elephants here, but that's my <laughs> my personal opinion. And I was just wondering. I hadn't heard that. We had a former city councilor that thought they should go in Rockwood, but oh. we we uh, got rid of them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I, I hadn't heard that one. Yes. 
Um, but in the Dean, same. have you heard anything about elephants in Roslyn Lake? For sure, yeah. 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 I hadn't heard that. Thank you, it's Lila. It's in the Sandy Post and on okay. online. Okay. I can get you the article. Okay. I think that was part of the uh, bond measure that they passed, that Metro passed for zoo enhancements. At the same time, our public safety levy was defeated. Oh, it was defeated? In 2008. We lost by, the public safety levy that Gresham put forward, that we put forward in 2008, was defeated by 4%. But the bond measure from Metro passed. So it was more important to take care of the elephants than the people. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, the basket for our drawing uh, back there. We'll have the the Honorable Shane Bemis do the drawing. Let me. I I, I do just want to clarify one thing I said when I said no to TriMet or to the, the light rail line. That's my position, maybe not the city. I, I think the city council would probably be along those same lines, but that's just my position, not the position of the Gresham City Council. Huh? Marguerite? Hey, all right. So, so lunch on us and actually uh, we will be, uh, we will not be meeting uh, in November and December because of uh, the holiday schedule. So shall I dare say it, be the first one to tell you, happy holidays. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, we also, but we also want to invite you to a special reception that the, uh, the Chamber and the Government Affairs Council will be hosting on Tuesday, November 13 at Riverview Community Bank, uh, across the, new, the new bank across the street from the, the high school. Uh, it'll be a time to, for us to meet our uh, current and newly elected uh, government officials. We are uh, we have invited uh, everyone from our uh, state legislators uh, on down to our city councilors in the um, in the region, uh, also county commissioners and uh, and metro councilors, uh, just for us to as a chamber to uh, get to know, meet, greet, and talk to our elected officials Tuesday. November 13, 5.30 to 7 at the Riverview Community Bank, uh, the new bank here in Gresham. And, uh, and that is uh, I just a week after Election Day, so I remember that. Uh, oh, please, and, and, and please RSVP, if you're going to be attending RSVP to uh, Barbara Malcolm, uh, her email is barbaram at greshamchamber.org. Or you can go online and RSVP. Okay, and we have it online on the website. So and you please take 20 seconds to fill out the evaluation form. That is great feedback for us uh, to know what topics are on your mind and, uh, and what items we can cover and cover better here at these programs. Thank you very much for coming. It's been a great year. We will see you uh, hopefully on uh, November 13, but if not, in January. Thank you for coming.